I see one of these music stands. I, I was a substitute teacher at the high school for 27 years. And because I had a musical background, I was often called in to um, do, do the band, to the band rooms, to direct the bands. And I had always had a good response. And I walked in one day, and I put my book on there, and the kids all were giggling away. And I thought, oh, somebody's told a joke. And, it kept on giggling, and I had the awfulest time keeping this class control. And finally, they were over. I think it was grade eight band, which are always hard to handle. And they finally left. And I went around to straighten up the chairs, and I looked, and guess what was written across the back here in, in white? F U C. <laughs> right across here in gray big letters. And that's why they were laughing at me for the whole time I was trying to delete the band. <laughs> Every time I see one of these, I, get, I start to laugh. And I think about that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I, oh, I didn't like oh. <laughs> oh, good. For those of you that don't know, this book is a <coughs> nonfiction. It is true stories. And it, the stories have either been told to me or by me of things that I have experienced and observed. And the, they mostly were told, the oldest stories, of course, were told to me by my father, who was a great raconteur. He could tell a story and just have you in the palm of his hand. So I told these stories to my students. And some of them used to say, oh, Mrs. Benson, you should write a book. And I said, oh, yeah, sure, one of these days. But I w it was almost my 80th birthday, and I decided if I didn't write them down, they would be lost and gone forever because there would be no one else to tell these stories of real life here in New Westminster. But it isn't just New Westminster. The stories are true no matter where you came from. The 40s were the 40s, and the 20s were the 20s, and the dirty 30s were the dirty 30s, and no matter where you lived. So I did write them down, and, and people have enjoyed them, and now they're safe. They're in writing, and they won't be lost forever. Mm -hmm. So, for Sin, Sin, Kuhn. Sin Kuhn, he read a story at the library about his grandmother. And it reminded me of a story that my father, that my Uncle George told me. <coughs> Uncle George was my father's youngest brother. And this is his, mostly about him. First of all, it talks about my family. My family's name was Sangster, and they came to New Westminster on a paddle wheel boat up the Fraser River from Victoria. The Sangster family came to New Westminster from Victoria in 1895. Elizabeth and Alexander had five sons and two daughters. Two of the boys were twins, Louis, my father, and, and Philip, his non-identical twin. During the voyage from Victoria on the sidewheeler Yosemite, Philip, age four, went missing. Panic as soon as passengers and crew searched the ship from stem to stern. Finally, a deckhand spotted him high atop the wooden housing that covered one of the great side paddle wheels. The four-year-old was face down on the very edge of the wooden housing with his head over the side watching in fascination as the great wheel propelled the ship through the waters of Georgia Strait. A deckhand climbed up the housing, retrieved little Philip, and returned him to his frantic mother. Three years later, when youngest child George was five, Elizabeth took him with her when she made her overnight trip back to Victoria to visit old friends. You can bet that she <coughs> kept a close eye 
to her, and kept him by her side as she <coughs> sat in the ladies' salon, a richly appointed area of the ship where ladies could go to avoid the riffraff sometimes aboard and the perpetual shower of hot cinders and flying soot that poured out of the smokestacks. <coughs> Ordinarily, native Indians and Chinese were allowed only on the open decks, whatever the weather. But on this particular trip, an exception had been made. A richly dressed Chinese woman who had been carried aboard by servants in a sedan chair was allowed to stay in the ladies' salon. She was obviously the wife of a very important Chinese merchant, and somehow strings had been pulled and palms had been greased in order to allow this non-Caucasian woman into the salon. My grandmother discovered that the young Asian woman, though only recently arrived from China, understood a fair amount of English. Eventually, as the two women gained a rapport, the young woman shyly lifted the hem of her beautifully embroidered garments and showed my grandmother Elizabeth her feet. Uncle George, who witnessed this, told me that although he was only five, he knew that what he was viewing was something out of the ordinary. He knew that no grown woman should have feet that small. Not small, tiny. She had the feet of an infant. They had been bound at birth. Foot binding was a sign of nobility because a woman with bound feet had to be carried everywhere and only the very rich nobility had the servant power to accommodate this kind of infirmity over a lifetime. It also prevented concubines from running away. Oh. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Uncle George sensed that revealing her feet to a non-Chinese person was somehow embarrassing for the lovely Chinese lady. Mm. And he realized that his mother, <clears throat> my grandmother, must have sensed this too. For then, Elizabeth Sangster raised the hem of her gown and showed the young woman her infirmity a high laced boot that had a four inch sole because Elizabeth had been born with one short leg and always used a cane whenever she traveled outside her house. Uncle George said that he would never forget the image of those tiny feet and in hindsight he often speculated on the suffering young woman must have endured as a child. Oh, wow. Wow.